The Trinity campus is conveniently located right next door to the University of Melbourne. The city centre is really close too. If you come to Trinity, you'll really get to experience the best that Melbourne has to offer. The campus is like smack bang in the middle of the city. So like you can experience city life, you can experience all of the good food. It's such a caring environment. It's an environment where everyone's out to make friends, everyone's out to meet new people. So it's it's a very safe space and it's it was a very good year for me. You'll be able to choose from many accommodation options, including homestays and purpose-built student accommodation. No matter where you live, you'll always feel part of the tight-knit Trinity community which includes an extensive alumni network of past students who live all over the world and who will always be willing to help you out even after you leave Trinity. Of course, you'll meet plenty of like-minded students at Trinity and will start university with plenty of friends. So really, Trinity College is the best option when it comes to your education, future job prospects and the chance to live in an amazing city and meet amazing people. Trinity College is currently offering foundation studies online, so you can start studying in your home country. Then join us and the University of Melbourne as soon as Australia's borders open. So apply now for Trinity College, your pathway to the University of Melbourne. And a very good afternoon to everyone who's joined us for tonight's live lectures. Welcome to the Trinity College live lectures for 2021. These live lectures we're calling the Trinity Talks. Over the coming seven weeks, students from all around the world are going to be joining us for a series of academic talks presented by some of our leading academics at Trinity College. Tonight, you're going to be hearing from one of our leading academics in physics, Dr. Paolo. I'll introduce him to you very soon. Trinity College is located on the campus of the University of Melbourne. And for over 30 years now, we've been preparing students for entry into the bachelor degrees at the University of Melbourne, into all bachelor degrees. In fact, those students who do the Trinity College Foundation Studies Program a guaranteed entry into Melbourne University. Every year we welcome students from all around the world onto our campus. And even throughout the COVID period, our students are still preparing online. We've got a world-class online foundation studies program and it's working extremely well. The University of Melbourne and uh, Trinity College are located together right in the city centre, as you see it there. Melbourne University continues to be Australia's number one ranked university and is currently ranked 33 worldwide. That puts us amongst a very special elite group of universities. Number one in Australia, a fantastic ranking. So tonight we have a fantastic lecture lined up for you uh, in physics. Um, it's an interactive uh, lecture. We'd love to hear your comments throughout the lecture. You can do this by putting your comments or answering the questions that might be posed in the chat function. Uh, our lecturer will be monitoring the chat function throughout tonight's lecture and we'll be looking for some of your comments. So please put them in there. If you have any questions about Trinity College or University of Melbourne, about how to apply, about scholarships or any other things not related to tonight's lecture, I'd encourage you to put these into the Q&A function on Zoom. My colleague, James Curley, who's with us right here. Hi, James. Good evening. Oh, good afternoon, Ben. And, uh, and to all of the people who've tuned in this afternoon, welcome again. Fantastic. Looking forward to a great session. And James uh, will be with us uh, behind the scenes throughout tonight's lecture, answering some of your questions, and you'll get to meet James during the uh, Q&A session right at the end. Uh, thank you, James, um, and I'll be joining you, joining you shortly behind the scenes. Um, the live lecture, as I've said, we'd love to hear your comments. There'll be questions put out to you. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, please put these into the uh, chat function. And remember students, this is an English lecture, so we'd love to hear your comments in English, 
okay? Um, please try to avoid uh, uh, using uh, languages from all over the world because others may not uh, understand them. And finally, keep your comments respectful. This is a university uh, and college lecture, so respectful comments, uh, please. Without any uh, further uh, delay, why don't we introduce our lecturer for tonight? Dr. Paolo, are you there? Dr. Paolo, great to have you uh, with us uh, this afternoon. Um, what have we got in store for us uh, today? What's the live lecture? Oh, Ben, it is a lecture that talks about the joy of learning physics in particular from my perspective. So that's what I will try to entertain our worldwide audience. Fantastic. Well, I'm going to hand over to you in just a moment. I'm just having a look here. We've got 610 participants from all over the world, Dr. Paolo. They're coming from places like Vietnam, from Indonesia. I can see the Philippines there. I can see Myanmar and Cambodia. And I can see all the way to Bulgaria, uh, Russia, and beyond. What a fantastic multicultural audience. I'm going to hand over to you, Dr. Paolo, and I'll see you for Q&A at the end. Good luck with your lecture. Thank you very much. OK, so share. All right, so good afternoon or good evening, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Paulo. I've been uh, lecturing at Trinity for a couple of years now. And it's my pleasure to once again be here talking about physics. I, this is something that I always enjoy to do, talk to physics to people who are interested in physics. So that is just the ideal scenario. So I'm very happy to be here tonight and to have the opportunity to talk to you all. And I would like to start by telling the story of how this lecture came to be. Okay. So it's a bit of a motivation of what was going on. So it actually starts a few days before I was invited to give a lecture for you guys tonight. And one of my daughters, my younger daughter, she is a volleyball player, uh, not a professional or anything. She's only a student, but she plays volleyballs on the weekends. And, and that means that I have to wake up every Saturday morning and drive her to, to a, a place near Melbourne where she, she participates in this uh, championship. And while all the girls are playing, of course, parents are sitting back there in the stand, watching them and rooting for them. And every now and then we start some conversations. We engage some small talk with other parents. And that is exactly what happened that particular Saturday that I'm showing here. Of course, this is not the actual photo of the thing because we didn't take any photos. It's just something that I took from the internet. But back there, in that, in that position there where I have my yellow rectangle. I was sitting there having some small talk with another dad. And if I zoom in there, you can see properly. So just to help your vision, I took the liberty of putting our faces there. So here I am, and here's the other dad. Well, Okay, it was not Will Smith that was sitting there, but that's the, the easy picture that I found on the internet. And this is the other dad's younger son. Uh, his girl was playing volleyball and uh, the younger son was just sitting there watching to, to the game with us. And we, as I said, we were having that small talk and eventually he asked me this question that always makes me a little bit, uh, worried. But anyways, he asked me, what do you do for a living? And then, of course, I had to tell him that I'm a physics teacher at, the, at Trinity College. And I want you to notice his change of reaction when I brought that up. Okay, so 
he was all happy and suddenly that's how he kind of looked at me. So not a very positive reaction, but anyways, you will see my point in a minute. The fact is that his boy realized that when I said that I was a physics lecturer, uh, his dad was a bit uh, uncomfortable, let's put it that way. And, and then uh, he asked his dad, what's physics dad? Really a young boy, he should probably be six or seven years old. So he didn't quite know what physics was. And that's the part that is important for me tonight. The answer that he gave to his young boy, okay? And this is the answer. He said, it is the toughest subject in high school. It is all about maths. And I wish I had answered the boy because I think I could give a much better answer than that. But anyways, that was the answer he gave. And that, that's what the boy got it. And I'm not sure if this boy will be very interested in physics after that. But anyways, that was just a small incident. But that got me thinking, okay? The game was over, we finished uh, our conversation and, and I came back home just thinking about what had happened, uh, about that question that the boy asked and about the answer that dad gave. And two things came to mind. The first thing is the question, what is physics? And when we think of physics, it is fair that the first thing that comes to mind is something like this on the right, on the left-hand side of your screen there, like a blackboard full of formulas and little diagrams and sort of complicated stuff. But if you took physics at school, you know that this is the kind of thing that your teacher will present to you. And to me, it is clear that this is what that man, that dad, most probably was remembering when he gave that answer to his boy. However, on the other hand, all of those formulas and all of those things are not there just for the sake of maths, right? Maths is cool, but when you do maths in physics, that has a purpose. And the purpose that we have in physics is to describe the real world which I will succinctly call reality, right? So we use formulas and we use equations exactly because we want to describe natural phenomena. Things like rainbows or the aurora or the formation of galaxies or even simple things like a spinning palm or ice melting or a balloon, a hot air balloon going up. So all of that maths that you see on the left is actually there because it is expressing through simple principles all the complexity that we see in the real world. And then I thought the ideal way of defining physics, at least from my perspective, would be something like this. Physics is this mathematical model of reality. And it is important that is mathematical, because when we use mathematics, we have this possibility of extending things and making predictions and trying to figure out how things are going to behave in the future, knowing how they are behaving at this point. So mathematics is a convenient language to express the reality and to make inferences uh, about that reality. And, and so that's why physics adopts this code for uh, that description. But that's all it is. It is a code, okay? It is like the language that we use to express the world. Physics is not all about maths. Physics is all about the things that surround us, the natural phenomena that surround us, and the technology that we want to develop, right? So. I think that is what that dad missed. I don't see that he was completely away from my definition, but he was putting far too much emphasis on the mathematical modeling. And he was really forgetting what physics was all about, which is a mathematical model 
and the emphasis is really here on reality. Okay, so that was the first thing that I had in mind after that conversation. And the second thing that came to mind was this guy. Okay, so does anybody know who this person is? If you know, right there on the chat, please. Let me see if anybody gets it quickly. Okay, there you go. Thank you, Keisha. That, that's him, Richard Feynman, right? So Richard Feynman is a very, uh, it's a phys he, he was a physicist, he already passed, unfortunately, but he was uh, one of, in my opinion, one of the greatest physicists that we had in the last, uh, in the last century, in the 20th century. And I remembered him because when it comes to connecting the real world with the mathematics, he was certainly a master, right? He knew how to do that very well. He actually got a Nobel Prize in physics in 1965 for doing something like that. He, he developed a theory that describes, uh, is a theory called quantum electrodynamics. And in, in very simple mathematical terms, he was able to describe a very complicated physical phenomenon. So that connection between physics and mathematics was very natural to him. And uh, I'm not going to talk about quantum electrodynamics because it's far too complicated, but just to give you an example of uh, how Feynman manages this connection, let me give you uh, 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 something that I found here. Here you have some tap uh, running out some water. And you may have noticed uh, already that when that happens, water curves. I'm exaggerating a little bit here in my drawing, but water makes this kind of funnel. And Feynman, as a child, he notices that. And one of his books later on, he, he, he wrote his memory. Uh, like this. So when I was in high school, I'd see water running out of a faucet, growing narrower, and wonder if I could figure out what determines that curve. So that curve that water naturally does was something that to Feynman came, well, this curve must have an equation because all the curves that we study in maths have some equation to it. So why not this one that appears in a natural thing like water running out of a faucet? And then he would use the physics that he learned, the basic principles that he learned from school. And he would, he actually found, right? Being a brilliant student, uh, uh, sorry, not this. Uh, he found that it was rather easy to find the equation of that curve. Now, okay, let's not worry whether it was easy or not. The fact is that he could find with a very good precision this equation here that describes the shape of that. And that's not my point. The point is just that he was able to connect the natural phenomenon of water running down with that formula. And the most important thing, he had fun doing this. And he did that for his own entertainment because that was cool, okay? This is the thing that that dad in the volleyball game completely lost. He was doing maths, but he was probably not connecting it to the real world. So he was losing all the fun of doing physics there was no joy in that. It was just doing maths for the maths. Remembering a formula, plugging numbers in it, getting a result, moving on to the next problem. That's boring, right? We don't want to teach physics in that way. Nobody wants to learn physics in that way. We really want to see how physics is describing what is happening around us. And so all of those things were in my mind and a few a days later, I got this message from Ben saying, hey, Paulo, would you like to give a lecture, a Trinity talk? And then I said, oh, yes, please. I have just the perfect topic to talk about. I want to talk exactly about this, about how cool it is to make physics when you can really connect the mathematics 
that is unavoidably in physics with the beautiful and interesting things that surround us in the real world. And that's what this talk is about, and that's how it came to be. Now that you know how we ended up here tonight, let's actually tell you how I am going to run this, okay? So uh, I decided to talk about two equations. And here I'm presenting the two guys that, that um, brought those equations to us. One of them I'm sure that you are very familiar with, Sir Isaac Newton. He was born around the middle of the 17th century. And of course, he made great contributions to physics. So great that we still remember him and we still learn him at school. That's one of the first things that we'll learn about physics at school are the Newton's laws of motion, right? And what I'm going to talk about tonight is one of those equations and you'll be familiar with it. But perhaps you are not so familiar with the connection of that equation with the real world. And that is one of the things I want to stress. And the other one, maybe you are not so familiar with it, but it is due to this other guy uh, called Erwin Schrödinger. He was an Austrian physicist. And he, you may have heard about Schrödinger's cat. I'm not going to talk exactly about Schrodinger's cat tonight, but the thing that I will be talking about is the origin of this Schrodinger's cat, whatever that is. If you, if you heard about it before, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, maybe you, want, you may want to ask me later what that is and I can say something about it. But anyways, those guys have two equations and my point is to show you how those equations connect with the real world and also how the equation that Newton proposed in the 17th century sort of serves the same purpose as the equation that Schrodinger proposed in the 20th century, okay? So that's my challenge and I have some 40 minutes to do that. So let's see how it goes. Newton's second law of motion. That's the equation I want to talk about. Can anybody write for me on the chat straight away, which, what is Newton's second law of motion as an equation? I'm sure that you know that one. <laughs> there it is. Thank you, Kanika. MA. There we go, F equals MA. Now I'm going to ask you another question. And perhaps this one, you won't answer so promptly, but let's see. Um, okay, the question is, what does that equation mean? How, why is that equation important? Why do you learn that equation so soon as you start learning physics? Anything like that, any one of those questions, your thoughts on the chat. Okay, I have something there. Uh, Tuto says, Newton's first law of motion predicts the behavior of objects for which all existing forces are balanced. That is correct, but we are talking about Newton's second law of motion. So Hannah says, describes the relationship between an object mass and the amount of force needed to accelerate it. That's correct, that is true. But I want something more, so let's, let me see. Uh, two says again, uh, Newton's second law of motion pertains to the behavior of objects for which all existing forces are not balanced. That's correct. When there is force, acceleration will be affected. Uh, that's right. Force is an accelerated mass. Mm, I wouldn't say that force is an accelerated mass. Max, I would say that forces, force can cause a mass to accelerate. Okay, good, thanks guys. However, uh, that's not exactly what I'm looking for. So when I talk about connecting that equation with reality and you just talk about what each term of, of the equation is, it is difficult to see exactly how that connection is taking place. So let me just go with you for a minute. 
when we first learn about Newton's second law of motion, uh, probably in your textbook or in some worksheet that your teacher is going to give you, you are going to find a bunch of problems that will look like this, right? I'm sure that looks familiar. Blocks in a complicated situation with pulleys, trolleys, inclined planes, and all of that. And then what do you do? The next step is always like that. Let's draw all the forces that are acting on each one of those blocks, right? And then you need to go through that list. You have gravitational force, you have normal force, tension force, friction, uh, elastic force, all types of forces, and you need to represent each one of them in each block. And you do that and things will look something like that. Don't worry about the details, okay? I'm just giving you the flavor of it, just to refresh your memory. But this is thing that you probably did before if you studied uh, physics at high school. Now, so what? What do you gain by doing all of that? Well, let's look at one of those masses. So let's pay attention just to this one here, okay? If you have all of those forces that represent how that block interacts with the world around it, you can sort of combine all of them in a single force. That is going to be the net force that appears on this side of the equation. So what does the net force actually give you? It's a summary of how that particle interacts with the world around it. Then you look at the mass of that particle. Let's say that that particle has mass m1. So this is going to be m1 here in the equation. What do you do next? Well, we know what the net force is. We know what the mass is. So we can use Newton's second law to calculate the acceleration. Great. But here's the question. Why do we care so much about calculating the acceleration? What's the point? What does knowing the acceleration have to do with the real world? How is this acceleration represented in our direct experience with those blocks? Anybody? Let's see if anything interesting comes up in the chat. Just throw it there, any thoughts? because everything remains in motion, right? Everything may remain in motion. May, it may actually stop as well, depending on the forces that you have there. You can have a force that decelerates the particle because it can explain many things in life. Oh yeah, that, that is a very good answer. And that's exactly my point, but I want a little bit more of detail. Oh, thank you, Carmel. I, th I like that you can find the displacement as well as the final velocity with the acceleration. And now we are getting to where I want to go, okay? As it turns out, if we know the acceleration that one of those bodies is going to have, we can find something very important. Let's, let's have a look. What is this thing? So here's a picture for you. You have this car. And apparently this car is moving very fast in this road. I know that for a, comp uh, a few hints here. First, I have this light, light this blur of light that is typical uh, to, to be captured in a photograph when you are moving very fast. Then if you look at the mirror here, you will see that the car is being chased by the police. And if you look here at the speedometer, you will see that, yeah, it is, hitting on the bottom there. So it's probably really fast. My question is, what does this tell us about the acceleration of that car? Let me give you some options. Uh, I will write here in yellow. Here's my question for you. The acceleration is alternative A very high, B, very small, is it C, zero, 
or is it the impossible to tell? Okay, let's let's see. I have C A D D A A A A D A D. All right. Well, I like that. Uh, okay, I think it would be fair to say that most people think the acceleration is very high. So for those of you who think that, I am so sorry, but you are just very wrong. Okay, the acceleration maybe is high, but it's really impossible to tell. Why? Why is it impossible to tell that the acceleration is very uh, high or very small or uh, small or zero? Because this is what acceleration is. Acceleration is a physical quantity that tells you how quickly the velocity changes. When you look at that picture, you see that the velocity is very high, right? You have a bunch of hints that make that very clear. But that picture, that is static picture, picture says absolutely nothing about how that velocity is changing over time. It doesn't even tell you if the velocity is changing over time because you are just looking at a point in time. You are not looking at succession of points in time. So there may not be information about the acceleration in a static photograph. Good. How can we make that definition of acceleration into an equation? How can we make a mathematical model of this sentence in this way? I can write that the acceleration, A, the same A that appears in Newton's second law, is this funny symbol here that looks like a fraction, but you shouldn't think of it as a fraction. Think of, think of it as an operation, okay? It's called derivative, but you don't need to know much about it, okay? All you need to know is that this symbol should be read as the rate of change of. The rate of change of what? Okay, that looks like an incomplete sentence, right? And it is. But to complete the sentence, you need to look at what comes next, V. So this equation here is telling me exactly that acceleration is the rate of change of velocity. If you think about it, this is exactly what's written here in words. It is how quickly the velocity changes. Good, so now we have a sentence and we know how to write that sentence mathematically. Fine, let's play this game once again, okay? What about velocity? What is velocity? We know we have a number of hints that velocity is high in that picture, but how can I explain velocity? for someone that doesn't know what that is. Well, this is a fair way of saying what velocity is. It is how quickly the position of something changes over time, right? Of course, if something is changing position over time, it's moving. And if something is moving, it has velocity. If it move, changes position quickly, that means that it's moving at a high velocity. If it's changing position slowly, it's moving at a high uh, with a small velocity. So how can we formalize that sentence mathematically? We can write in this form. Velocity is the rate of change of position. Here, x is representing my position, okay? Or if you want to know, you can think of that dx as the displacement. I see that some people on the chat are talking about displacement, yeah? But I'm thinking of the rate of change of the position. So it's like the displacement divided by time. Very good. So what? Why am I talking about this now? Am I losing you? Well, I will bring it all together now. Remember, the acceleration was our object of interest. So if that acceleration is the rate of change of velocity, and the velocity is the rate of change of position, that means that the acceleration has a direct connection with the position of the particle. It's just a matter of knowing how to do this operation, this mathematical operation, 
that calculates the rate of change of something. Okay, and we know how to do that. Maybe you don't remember now, but as I said, the details don't matter much. My point is that if you know the acceleration, you can figure out what is going to be the position of the particle at any time in the future, right? Because the same way that A is related to X, you can sort of write that relationship backwards and find how X is related to A. And when you use that back in Newton's second law and you replace your acceleration with this second rate of change of position, you see that Newton's second law is like a crystal ball. It allows you to predict where the particle is going to be, what is going to be the position of the particle. If you know how that particle interacts with the world around it, and what, uh, what is the property of that particle that we call mass, how heavy that particle is. That's why we talk about the importance of Newton's second law, because it probably does one of the most important things in physics, that is predicting where something is going to be if you know how that something interacts with the world around it. So this is my summary. This is the thing that I would like you to remember about Newton's second law in the future. Of course, you need to be able to solve problems and calculate accelerations, but it's not because of the acceleration that we are so interested in it. We are interested in it because the acceleration will allow you to know where the particle is going to be. And that is the connection between that law and the real world, okay? Knowing things, at a certain point in time, you can propagate them and figure out where they are going to be anytime in the future. Good. Some examples, always handy. Well, Newton came up with his law exactly because he wanted to figure out whether the positions of the planets uh, in orbit around the sun, uh, where they were going to appear. Uh, another scientist called Johannes Kepler had very good observations of the positions of those planets. And Newton wanted to develop a mathematical model that was compatible with those observations. And so he developed F equals MA and a few other equations. And he saw that using that, he could accurately reproduce in theory what Kepler had observed in reality. So big success of F equals MA. Physics, mathematical equation matching the real world. Another example, a friend of Newton observed this thing here on the sky, right? And there were records that this thing had appeared for a number of years, 1531, 1607, 1682. They didn't know if that those occurrences were the same celestial body at that time. But this guy, using Newton's equations, realized that it could be the same body that was appearing again and again. And if he was right, it would appear again in 1758. And guess what? It did. And because the guy who predicted that was Edmond Halley, this is what we call the Halley Comet up to this day. By the way, you will probably see it again in 2061 or 62 when it passes through our planet again. I'm not sure if I'll be around, but I'm sure that you guys will be. So another, uh, the prediction of that thing in 1758 was one of the first evidences that Newton's F equals MA was actually working. And there were many others. Uh, Halley also predicted a solar eclipse in London in 1715. Unfortunately, he wasn't alive to see the, uh, the comet in 1758, but he was alive to see the eclipse in London in, in 1715. And you can use Newton's second law to a number of other different things. You can use to predict when lunar eclipses are going to happen, and you can use even 
to develop new technology, things like cannons or even sending the men to the moon. Because instead of just describing uh, natural phenomena, you can use Newton's second law to uh, engineer the world. You can say, well, I want this person, I want this rocket to be on the moon at this time. What is the force that I need to apply on it now? So you are still talking about F equals MA, but now you give the acceleration, you give the position in the future, and then you figure out what's the force. And then you ask engineers to produce a booster that will give you that force. All right, so this is the first part of my talk, and I hope that this made it clear for you how Newton's second law connects uh, with the real world. I would like to pause a little bit now to give you guys a chance to ask me questions. If there is anything that I said that I explained too fast, or you didn't get, or any comments that you want to make, I will ask you to raise your hand, and then I will pick a few of you to ask questions, and I will try to give you some answers. And after that, we'll move on to the next part. So when you are ready, uh, raise your hand or put uh, something on the chat, and we will open the mic, and you will be able to ask your question. So let's have a look. I'm waiting for volunteers to talk to me. Okay, so Tuto, would you like to ask your question in person? Uh, yes, please. Uh, yes. I want to ask if you can go fast enough to get enough mass to become a black hole. Oh, all right. Uh, um, no, I, I mean, there is a limit of how fast anything that has mass can go. And a black hole has mass, right? And the limit uh, is the speed of light. Uh, basically, the way to become a black hole is not moving too fast. The way of becoming a black hole is having a lot of mass concentrated in a very small volume, but it's not necessarily related with the acceleration of that thing. So uh, I, I wouldn't bring that to this context, but, uh, but, uh, but it, it, it is a good question, but I, I don't see how accelerating can produce a black hole. It's more, a black hole is produced by the collapse of mass to a very small region of the space. Uh, let's see, another question. Uh, Paul Nguyen, so what would you like to ask? Uh, if according to Newton's second laws, we can predict that a thing more sits and rise, so why some we predictions still wrong? So so come again. Uh, according to Newton's second law, we can know where things are going to be. So so what's the second part? Uh, so why some predictions still wrong? Like a planet, uh, still do hit other planets, but uh, unknown like NASA calculating. Uh, they will not uh, hit each other. Okay, so I guess you, what you are saying is this, if Newton's second law is so great and it can tell us where everything is going to be if we know how it interacts, why there are things that we, we can't make very good predictions about, right? So there is a reason for that, uh, two reasons. So if you think about my, uh, let me go back here. Newton's second law will only give you those great predictions if you can give first a very accurate model of how that thing is interacting with the world around it. So if you, you need to tell what the force is with a very le high level of precision, right? And you also need to know a point in time where that thing is. But let's say that this one is easy to do and we know where a certain thing is at a certain point in time, we may not be able to know exactly 
how it interacts with the world around it. So if there is a small mistake that you make in this force, let's say that you know the force, but there is a small deviation there, you know the force plus or minus a small deviation of the force, that can cause a very different uh, result. It can give you a prediction that doesn't is not compatible with the reality. And there is one more thing that I should add, add to your question, which is this. Even if you know that force with a very high level of accuracy, and you know the initial conditions of the motion, and you know the mass of the particle, and you plug all of those things in Newton's equations, it may still be very hard to solve that equation. Okay, depending on what is the expression of the force that you have here, it may be mathematically difficult to come up with the solution of that equation. So that, that is a technical difficulty. And this is very common in physics. Uh, the, we, you have the right propagator. You have the equation that tells you the future. But unfortunately, you don't know how to solve that equation with the accuracy that you need. So that's where things go south. Good. Um, all right, uh, last one. Josh Jerickson, Lopez, what is your question? Um, hello, sir. Um, hello. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I just have a quick question about, um, because I, I see this equation as quite simple, having only three variables, actually only two, resulting to the summary, which is the force. Um, so we have f is equal to ma, and um, would this uh, no, would this um, equation um, sort of gradate or become more complex if, say, for example, we take into account a car has um, mass and it has an acceleration, it has a velocity, but what if we take into consideration other factors such as the wind? Or say, for example, this car is running and it it drives through a slope. Um, mm -hmm. So definitely it would fly. And do we take into account the slope to which the car is uh, moving? Do we take into account the, the, the wind that is going against the car? Do we take into account the aerodynamic um, factors of the car? If ever, do we study that? Um, eventually a more complex um, version of this equation. Absolutely. That's a very good point. Remember in this situation here, uh, we have F equals MA. And I told you that in order to know what this F is, you really need to know all the interactions of the particle with the world around it. So it is not just the engine of the car pushing the car forward. There is also the wind, there is also a bird, a little insect that hits against the windscreen. All of those things are inside that F. So I understand the equation looks very easy. It's just F equals MA, but hidden behind that F, there is a lot of complexity. And that's exactly at this point that the equation gets complicated to solve. For these situations with blocks here, those forces are all constants, okay? They are all the same. And so the equation is very easy. That's why we do it at a high school. But when you go to university and, and, and so on, uh, you start to deal with forces which are not constants, forces that change over time and change depending on the position. And then the resulting equation of Newton's second law becomes a real nightmare to solve. But yes, if you pursue a career in physics uh, or engineering, you are going to deal with those cases. And they will all start from F equals MA, but there will be a lot of work to put into finding what is the correct expression for F. All right, let's roll on. So thank you very much for your questions. And it's time to talk about something else. So I'll move back to where I was. And this is my slide now, the death spiral. What I mean by that is the following thing. Newton's second law is great, but unfortunately people realized 
that it may fail. Okay. And in the beginning of the 20th century, people started to find situations where Newton's second law makes wrong predictions, right? After all of those successes that we, I mentioned, something was not working. So what was that? Have you heard of the atom? That's the thing. In the beginning of the 20th century, people started to take very serious the idea that uh, matter was formed by a bunch of very small entities called the atom, and they had some models for that. The problem is, of course, that being this elementary building block of matter, it's very small and you can observe it directly. So the only way that you can figure out or make conjectures about what the atom is like is looking at uh, uh, consequences of the atom. So for example, you can't see the atom, but when you shed light on it, you can see something coming out of it that might give you an idea of what the atom is really like, okay? And people started to do experiments like that. And after a while, they came up with a model for the atom, at least for the simplest atom that there is, which is the hydrogen atom. And they said, well, the hydrogen atom is something like that. It, it, in the very center of it, you have some positive electric charge and going around it, you have an electron that is some negative electric charge. And they had good reasons to believe that this electron was going around in a circle around uh, the proton. So in the center, this positive charge is called proton and this negative charge is called electron, okay? Good. So what's the problem? Somebody thought, oh, so I have this electron going around the proton. I can figure out by using Newton's second law where the electron is going to be at any time, right? All I need to know is to figure out how those particles interact with each other. What is the force between the proton and the electron? And if I know the mass of the electron and where the electron is started, I can tell with high precision where that electron is going to be in that orbit at any point. And then very happy, people got the, the system, they figure out how to model that force we have a very good theory that explains what is the force to use here. And they put in the equation and they solved the equation. You know what they got? This. They found that applying Newton's second law with the right expression of the force, the solution predicted that that electron would spiral around the proton and would eventually crash against it. It was incompatible with Newton's second law and the theory of electromagnetism that the electron would be spinning around forever as, is, as it was expected by the, the, the observations. So that's why uh, people started to be very suspicious of Newton's second law. And then a lot of smart people got together and started to think about this problem. And this is a photograph of that smart people. Okay, so this is a conference they had in Brussels in 1927. Uh, and this conference was to discuss uh, ideas like what is wrong? Why can't we use Newton's second law to, more, to figure out the position of the electron around the proton? And people say that this is the most intelligent picture that was ever taken. Because look at this, at this time in 1927, I had one, two, three, four, five, six people in, those pic in that picture were already recipients of the Nobel Prize. Okay, so you had six physics Nobel Prizes in that picture. Uh, the, their names and the years they got the Nobel Prizes are there. You even have Marie Curie who got the Nobel Prize twice. Can you imagine that? She got the Nobel Prize for physics and for chemistry. So really out of this world. Right, but that's not all. After that picture was taken, all of these people here got Nobel Prizes. So you see, you've got to go to the right conferences 
right? So there are 29 people there, 17 of them received the Nobel Prize in physics. But anyways, in conferences like this, they were discussing the problem of the electron around the proton. And in particular, this guy here that I'm highlighting with green called Schrodinger had an idea. Well, maybe the problem is that Newton is, is with Newton's second law. Maybe Newton's second law doesn't apply when we want to make predictions about the motion in this very small scale. So I will come up with a new equation to do just that. I want a new equation that tells me where that electron is going to be at any time. And so he did it. He proposed this equation here. This is called, of course, Schrodinger equation. And it is, uh, uh, some people say that it is one of the most fundamental equations of quantum um, physics. And because quantum physics is taken to be the most fundamental theory of reality, in front of you right now, you have one of the most fundamental equations of our world, or at least the way we understand it. It would be great if we understand that equation, right? And this is what I want to do briefly with you. I will try to be short uh, because I want to give time for questions. So I'll skip a few things and I will cut to the, the key point. So this thing here is just an imaginary number. Uh, it is, it, it is uh, a number, it's a constant, it doesn't change over time, uh, and it corresponds to the square root of negative one. So crazy thing. It is the kind of thing that mathematicians do and you would never expect to see in an equation of physics because we think that physics is about things that we can measure and we never measure imaginary numbers. That's why they are called imaginary numbers in the first place. They, but anyways, Schrodinger put that in his equation. This other symbol here is called reduced Planck's constant. The fact is reduced is it has this bar here. Just the H is Planck's constant. That H bar is Planck's constant divided by two pi, but then we just give that name. What is that number doing there? It's really just telling you that this equation is only important when you go into the very microscopic scale. So if you are dealing with big things like planets, uh, cars, blocks, you are all right, don't bother about this equation. But if you are going to model matter in its inner parts, then this is where you need to go. This is what that H is doing there. Then you have the DDT here, the same DDT that appears in Newton's uh, second law. So it's the rate of change of, rate of change of what? Ah, this guy. By the way, this guy appears here and here, and I will tell you what it is in a moment, okay? That is the key part I want to concentrate on. Finally, you have this H here, and this H is the part of Schrodinger's equation that tells you how the particle interacts with the world around it. So essentially that H is doing in Schrodinger's equation what F does in Newton's second law. It lets the equation know how things are connected. So that H can make that equation very difficult to solve if that electron is connected in a difficult, in a complicated way. But anyways, uh, that is the summary. Now let's talk, I will skip all of this, and let's talk about this Psi here. This Psi is the key point. When we say that we solve the Schrodinger equation, we find Psi. Just like when we solve Newton's second law, we find the position as a function of time. So this Psi, uh, it, it is our object of desire here. It gets a special name, it's called wave function. And the thing that you need to know about the wave function is what it is not, okay? Unfortunately, the wave function is not the position as a function of time. That's not what you get when you solve Schrodinger's equation. 
That is the position as a function of time is what you get when you solve Newton's second law. Because remember, F equals M d2 dt2 of x. So there is a way of making this x the subject of the equation and solving for it. But unfortunately, the psi that we will get from Schrodinger's equation doesn't give you that. So you might say, what does it give me then? Because you promised me, teacher, that you would give me a replacement for Newton's second law. And this replacement is not working because it's not giving me the same thing. All right, I will make it a little bit worse and then I will make it a little bit better. That psi is not even real. Because of that i in the equation, the wave function here is going to be an expression that depends on x and t, but that's going to give a value that only makes sense for mathematicians, right? I's, not things that can be measured. Okay, so why did we spend time on this? Well, because if you take this psi of x and t, think about it, you give a position, you, you ask about a position at a certain point in time, and then you calculate a psi, a value of psi. If you take this value of psi and do some maths with it, if you are curious to know, the maths that you need to do with it is this. You need to take the absolute value of that, that makes that uh, complex number into a real number, and then you square it. That thing is a remarkable thing. It gives you the probability of detecting the particle in the position x at time t. So look at this, this is important. You won't be able, by solving Schrodinger's equation, to find where the particle is going to be at any point in time. However, by solving that equation and by picking a certain point in the space at a certain moment of time, you can get the probability of finding the particle sitting there, all right? So I would say it's the second best thing you can hope for. It is not deterministic. It doesn't tell where the electron is going to be but it can tell you what's the likelihood of finding the electron at a certain point at a certain time. And if you study the chemistry, you probably saw this picture before, those orbitals. Those orbitals are exactly the solution of the Schrodinger equation. So let's look at one of them here. What is this saying? In this very bright region that you have here and here, all of those points here, you have a very high probability of finding the electron sitting there at a certain point in time. But as you move radially away along that line, you see that the brightness decreases, which means that that probability is going down. Okay, So that is the result of the Schrodinger equation. It doesn't give you the position, but it gives you the likelihood of finding it at that position. And then you might say, hmm, okay, maybe uh, we don't have the position of the particle at any time because Schrodinger didn't work so hard. Maybe there is a better equation that is yet to be discovered that will tell us precisely where the electron is going to be at any time. And then we can throw all of this away and replace Newton's second law with something better. Well, maybe Einstein, for one, was one of the scientists who thought that that was the case. He thought that Schrodinger's equation was actually incomplete and there could be something better done about it, but he was never able to do it. And in fact, nobody has ever been able to find anything better than Schrodinger's equation. And as time goes by, we start, physicists start to realize that indeed, it looks like Schrodinger equation is really the very fundamental thing. And the uncertainty that is associated to it, it's not lack of information. Uh, it's not, it is not that he didn't work hard enough. It is just a fundamental uncertainty of the universe in that very small scale. 
And because that very small scale is the thing that we take for being the building block of the entire universe, we can say that this probabilistic nature is in the very core of the universe that we live. At least that is the current position. And that's where you, you need to move away from Newton's second law. Good. So that brings me to the end of my exposition. My last slide is very short. I just want to tell you about a collection of books uh, called the Feynman Lectures on Physics, which were produced from the lectures that Richard Feynman gave in Caltech back in 1962 and 1963. Those lectures were uh, for students taking their first and second year at the university. And in my opinion, they are like one of the greatest texts, books in physics. And if you are into the kind of thing that I presented to you today, like looking at an equation and understanding how that equation models the real world around you, and you find that joyful, you, you have fun with that, you should definitely try it. And the good news is that it's freely available. Okay, if you go to this link here, you can just read the books at your will. So enjoy that. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm here for answering your questions. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Paolo. Um, what a fantastic lecture and uh, so much information there. Um, students, now it's uh, your opportunity. Um, who would like to ask a question directly to our lecturer, Paolo, if you'd like to, um, to uh, stop sharing your screen. Yeah, I will do that. That's wonderful. Okay. okay. So we've got, if you could raise your hand in the chat, guys, if you want to ask a question directly to our lecturer, uh, Dr. Paolo. I've got uh, Keith. Keith uh, from Vietnam. I'm going to open your microphone. Go ahead, Keith, and ask your question. Um, I want. I wonder that uh, can this can that equation used in a normal life, like used in the car system or something? I just you wonder mean, that. You mean Schrodinger's equation? Uh, the, the yes. No, you you wouldn't do that. The results that you would get by applying Schrodinger's equation to a car doesn't match any reality. Remember that H bar that you have in the equation? That is the hint that you can only use that equation in really microscopic scales. The equation is completely nonsense if you use in ordinary things of our day-to-day -day life. Thank you very much, Keith, for your question. Uh, we've got lots of questions coming in here. Um, I'm going to uh, next invite uh, Ngop. Okay, that's Tuan Kit Vo Ngop. Uh, go ahead and ask your question. Ngop Oi. Yeah, I'm here. Go for um, it. So I want to ask you about Newton's second law of motion. Um, does it have any relevance with uh, how the Newton, how Newton uh, calculates the mass of the Earth? Oh yeah, you, you can use that to uh, remember F equals MA. So uh, during this talk, I went, uh, I assumed that you know F and that you know M, and then you can solve the equation for A. But if you know F and you know A, then you can solve the equation for the mass. And people actually do that. So for example, we can uh, figure out what's the mass of the earth by looking at a satellite going around the Earth. Uh, we have a very good model for the force between the two. And uh, we also have a very good model for the acceleration of that. So by solving that equation for M, we can uh, estimate uh, the, the, the mass of the Earth. And that is, by the way, how we figure out the mass of our planet, is always by looking at how long it takes for the planet to go around that gives you a way 
of finding the, the, the acceleration. And then you use the model between the forces and then you solve for the mass. Yes, you can do that. You can solve for anything uh, that you like as long you as, as you have the other two things. Thank you very much, Nop. Uh, Kelly Hung Tao, uh, go ahead and ask your question of Dr. Paolo. Uh, Kelly Hung, Hung Tao. Yes, go. can you hear me? Yes, we can. You yeah. might need to speak up, uh, Kelly. Go ahead. Okay. Can you hear me clearly? I, I can hear you clearly. Go on. Okay. The first I want to ask you about, do you know how many assets create about electron? Uh, do I know about what of the electron? Uh, I, yes. How about I? Access tracing. Do you know it? Did you get that, Ben? No, I didn't. Um, sorry, Kelly. Perhaps uh, maybe write your question into the uh, the chat, and we and we will put it to uh, Dr. Paolo. Uh, there is a having... word that I I don't get, Kelly. I get most of it, but I think I'm missing the key word. If you can write that on the chat, it might be easier for me to understand what that is about. Okay, I will do it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Kelly. Um, we've got a couple more questions here that we'll take if, uh, if we've got time, uh, Dr. Paolo. Oh, yeah. Um, we've got another, uh, we've got Albert uh, Adiputra. Albert, uh, who I suspect is from uh, Indonesia. Uh, Albert, I'm going to allow you to talk. Albert, go ahead. Uh, yes. So how does the temperature of the sun get calculated? Oh, the temperature of the sun. OK, uh, that is not really related to the things that we were discussing today. But just to give you a, a brief idea, you can take, uh, basically, you can look at the light that comes from the sun here. And you can study the spectrum of that light. So by looking at the components of wavelengths that you have there, you can have a very good idea of what's the temperature in the sun. That is called the black body radiation theory. Uh, you can look up. Thank you. Details. Thank you very much, uh, Albert. Uh, we're going to ask Keisha. Keisha Mina, um, who's been waiting patiently here. Keisha, go ahead and ask your question. Uh, I just wanted to ask uh, about the how do we relate the Schrodinger's equation to the uncertainty principle, since both are about the uncertainty of objects? That's right. They are, they are very closely related, and uh, one can be derived from the other. To show you exactly how that can be done, I would need more time. But uh, basically, the uncertainty principle says that uh, the, the position of the electron and the speed of the electron or the momentum of the electron cannot be uh, calculated, both of them with high uh, precision at the same time. If you know a lot about one, you need to lose information about the other. Uh, the reason why that happens is intrinsically inside Schrodinger's equation. But to show you the details of how to link the two, I would need another half an hour. So I well, Doc, Dr. Paolo, that might be the next topic for your next lecture. We're going to take two last questions and wrap up for uh, this afternoon. Uh, Mahish, Mahish, would you like to ask your question of, uh, of Dr. Paolo? Hi, Dr. Paolo. Good evening. Good evening. I'd like to ask about the formulas. Uh, some, some formulas, they use a uh, first derivative and some formulas they use second derivative actually what's the difference between first derivative and second derivative oh thank you for asking that that's a great question so uh the first i mean the answer is right there right uh, if you are calculating the first derivative of something you are just looking at how that something changes uh, over time and if you're calculating the second derivative you are calculating how the change of something changes over time. In terms of equations, that makes a lot of difference, right? And you may have realized that Newton's second law is a second derivative. 
and Schrodinger equation is a first derivative. And uh, one of the things that, uh, one of the consequences of that is that when you solve Schrodinger equation, you have something that is called the superposition principle. You have many different solutions. And when you combine those solutions together, the combination is also a solution. You don't get that kind of thing when you have second equations that go with the second derivative over time. So in a way, uh, mathematically speaking, I could actually say that Schrodinger's equation is simpler than Newton's equations. But uh, the fact that you have that I in Schrodinger's equation brings back some of the mathematical complexity to, to the theme uh, that sort of makes up for not being a second derivative equation. But anyways, this is again, one of those things that we could spend a lot of time discussing, uh, but I, I just want you to, to keep this idea in mind. Schrodinger equation is first derivative over time. So superposition of solutions will be solutions of the Schrodinger equation. That doesn't happen with Newton's uh, uh, second law. And uh, there are many consequences coming out of this. Thank you very much. Uh, our last question, uh, and then we'll, we will tie things up. Um, we've got Charleston Gunawan. Uh, Charleston, go ahead and uh, ask your question. Uh, yeah. Um, since Schrodinger's equation is uh, for really small things, is it possible that there's something so big that the Newton second law doesn't apply to it anymore? Oh, yeah. Um, right, uh, that, that is a, a great question. So how do I answer this? Uh, yes, there is. Uh, there are things that we know that Newton's second law doesn't apply, but then it's not for the same reason uh, that, that uh, you need to change to, to Schrodinger's equation in the microscopic scale. It is for other things that are related to general relativity and not to quantum physics. So Newton modeled uh, uh, the space and he said that things attract each other because of those forces. And in general relativity, we think that there are no forces. Okay, so there is no F for that equation. What you have is that the fabric of the universe is deformed in some points. So when you have a black hole, for example, in a point of the space, that creates a huge funnel in the fabric of the universe. And then light, for example, propagating in that region will bend because the space is bent around the black hole, not because it is being attracted, mass attracting mass. So it is in that sense that Newton's second law fails in macroscopic scales. Uh, you need uh, yet another theory to describe gravitational attraction. And, and by the way, it's very hard to reconcile general relativity with quantum physics. Nobody has ever been able to do that. So one more thing to get a Nobel Prize for. Well, uh, not yet, uh, Dr. Paolo, but perhaps there's some students with us uh, this afternoon who might come to Trinity College and the University of Melbourne and, uh, and work on towards a solution to that in the future. Uh, Dr. Paolo, thank you very much uh, for such a, an insightful lecture. The questions keep coming and I'm sure that we could fill another hour at least. Um, uh, I'd like to thank my colleague, James uh, Curley, who's with us. James, if you're there. Yes, uh, you've rescued me. My fingers have just about come off. There's been so many uh, contacts through the Q&A, Dr. Paolo, um, and a lot of very, very complimentary commentary about your lecture. So uh, cool. I think the students have enjoyed it. I've certainly enjoyed it, but I'm a little bit disappointed. I couldn't focus on it because I was answering so many questions. In the I, Q &A. I can give you a special one. Good. Um, I, perhaps I'll look at the recording. Uh, I did get a few uh, questions about your slides. I'd just like to make sure the students know we will upload a recording of tonight's session on our website, um, on the page where you registered to attend today. 
Uh, look for it later on this week. Uh, we'll definitely put it up. And each week we'll, we'll upload a recording of the session. So if you want to have another look at it and maybe slow it down and really concentrate on the material, it'll be up on the website soon. Thank you very much, James. It's worth pointing out at this point, students, those of you who are still with us, attend all seven of these lectures and you will be awarded with a certificate of participation with your name on it, issued specially by Trinity College and signed by our academic dean. So join all seven. Next week, we've got another excellent uh, lecture coming up. Uh, Trinity College Foundation Studies, the pathway, the guaranteed pathway to Australia's number one university, the University of Melbourne. If you do want more information, my colleague is going to put our contact email into the chat. Please contact us at any time. If you're a grade 11 or 12 student, we've got intakes coming up uh, in the next semester and also next year, lots of them. Do contact us, applications are free. We'd love to see you uh, sometime at Trinity College. My colleague will put the email address into the chat right now. Next week, as I said, a really exciting lecture coming up. This is going to be chemistry next week. And Dr. Brendan is going to focus particularly on uh, food waste. What happens when we waste food? Where does it go? It goes into landfill. Um, and that contributes a lot to uh, all kinds of um, uh, greenhouse gases and other uh, sustainable practices. So. Join us next week when Dr. Brendan looks at how chemistry can solve the problem of food waste. We'd like to see you there. On behalf of Trinity College, thanks for uh, joining us for the first of this Trinity Talk series. Look forward to seeing you next week and bye for now.